We had the best time doing the initial breakdown of the body language and behavior in this video, and we decided we'd revisit some of our favorite moments from it. No, she's not good with cameras, so I apologize. But we were just like, for anybody that has any information, I don't remember a lot. What I did remember, I was breaking up, you know, with the cops, but I know that if, if, if anybody's got anything, any, any places that I could have gone, anybody, did you know who you are? Please, see, find him, please. It would mean a lot. It would mean everything to us. And that's... Family ain't the same without family. That's for sure. Is there anything else? All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so let's just look at the linguistics uh, going on, because for my money, they're enough. He kicks off with, I don't remember a lot. I don't remember a lot. Well, that's that's handy. And I think, you know, maybe many of you will remember the episode we did uh, just the other week. And Chase was saying one of the trickiest things you can do to an interrogator is like, I don't remember. Well, he's already started that process of going, it'll be quite a good alibi if I don't remember anything. And, you know, there's a good chance there's some drug abuse there uh, as well. And so may well, may well doesn't remember. OK, um, I do remember I was breaking up with the cops. But I did remember I was breaking up, you know, with the cops, but... Well, that just doesn't, I mean, you know, to, to one of Greg's points last week, sometimes culture and linguistics can come in. But even with culture and linguistics, I don't think that makes any sense. But let's, let's, let's carry on. Um, uh, if anybody got anything, any places I could have gone. If anybody's got anything, any, any places that I could have gone. Okay, if anybody got anything, any places I could have gone, uh, anybody, you know who you are. Anybody, did you know who you are? Well, okay, that seems to point in one direction. That seems to point to him. Uh, any places I could have gone, anybody got any places I could have gone, you know who you are. Okay, it's either pointing at him or it's still very confusing. It would mean uh, a lot. It would mean a lot. It would mean everything to us. And then he continues with, um, family ain't the same without family. Family ain't the same without family. Well, let's just break this down. We've got a lot of eyes. It's a lot about I. So it's all about them and family, not about CJ. And it's not about what you might be able to do out there, what you might be able to do about helping CJ, helping that child right now. It's a lot about us and and I and family ain't the same without family that for me is distancing so a lot of a lot of word salad there which could be cultural but I don't think it is I think there might even be some kind of embedded confession it's about I the cops us and distancing around the idea of family rather than let's talk about the child and how you could help the child right now I, I, I'll leave it at that because I I, I could take up more but there'll be uh, there'll be less left for other people. Chase, what do you got? Yep, absolutely agree. We have another case of the missing perpetrator. We need a sound of it. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Mark. And, you know, as, as I'm always fond of saying, it's a great quote that I invented, uh, you know, the behavior panel wouldn't be the same without the behavior panel. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Let's quickly walk through the Chase Hughes four-step checklist that we used in the last video when we we're talking about missing people. Number one, where's the concern directed? Is it story, plot, innocence, or the missing person's return and safety? Number two, are the moments of stress or fear associated with their guilt or associated with the missing person? Number three, is the information provided specific 
and directed toward finding the person. And number four, is the sadness more or less visible than the stress? So which one's higher, sadness or stress? So I just kind of made that quick reference. This entire monologue is story focused and it's not, not talking about CJ at all. The husband, I think, is a has some mental issues. I'm not a diagnostician nor qualified to make a diagnosis, but this certainly looks like a malignant narcissist. Uh, on a base level. And uh, the rest of this, the rest of these videos, his behavior is controlling and threatening. And while expressing zero sadness, there's zero concern for the return of the baby. And his only stress behaviors are in response to potential threat of being found out or be, or slipping up in the story. There's no grief on the wife, uh, only fear. We do see fear. We don't see sadness and grief. Both of them are more focused on getting this over with. And just kind of let's wrap this up. Uh, and I think the sheriff already knows that he's he's wanting him to keep talking. And that that phrase, like you said, Mark, the places I could have gone, we know where it happened. So I think this is a a, a slip, Freudian or otherwise. Uh, Greg. Yeah, I don't think we're dealing with Einstein here, first off. So his word patterns are probably a, a result of poor education, maybe, you know, that kind of thing. It also could be a result of lots of chemicals over time and not clear patterns of thought. Um, the thing for me, I'm going to say this out loud. Somebody's going to feel sorry for this knucklehead in the comments um, and say he needs counseling. Yeah, well, wall-to-wall -wall counseling is what he needs. He needs some kind of for hurting this kid. Anyway. All relationships have weird body language. They're all microcultures, every one of them. But most relationships don't have the microculture and the expression of fear. When a person holds another person by the shoulders, typically it's comforting. This woman's arm is across her torso and locked up tight. I agree. I don't see grief in either of these people talking about a baby who is missing. Now, Mark, I'll give you an alternative. What I think probably he's saying, he's saying, I remember we were breaking up and we were I think cops, he's editing as he speaks because he's cautious what he's going to say. And I don't think he's swift. I think he's just, or my dad would have said he ain't too swift. I think he's just rolling along and he's trying to tell a story and editing along the way. And he's probably saying, hey, him and his girlfriend, wife, whatever the relationship, I'm not sure. Maybe they were breaking up. I told the cops is kind of what I hear. But I did remember I was breaking up, you know, with the cops. But Remember, I'm a deep South boy too. So I live in the world that's a little different. Then I also hear him saying, anybody who knows where I would have been. Any, any places that I could have gone. That sounds code to me, like I'm blasted out of my mind and driving around, is what that sounds like, code for me. So I think there's probably, he's starting this whole story about how it happened, and he might not even remember how it, who knows? I'm, I don't know enough details of the case. But I would, I'm, I'm always cautious to try to read too much into language patterning in cultures that are this odd, because this is... This is South Alabama, or they call it L.A., Lower Alabama. This is Lower Alabama, and this is a poorly educated guy and also appears to have a drug issue and anger issues. If I were stroking my wife's hair to make her feel more comfortable, it wouldn't be with my knuckles, for example. There's all kinds of signaling of threat in this guy's body language. You can't miss it. And then she goes into something that Scott and I call transfer immediately. Doesn't mean she killed the kid, means she's hiding something. And that hide, when we prioritize our our feelings, grief takes back seat if there's an immediate threat often. We're gonna get our bodies out of the place and we can deal with grief later. And she covers her face and she starts to be emotional and kind of rocking. And that's what we call transfer, emotionally unavailable so you can't talk to her. You guys already hit on the fact that her body is trying to separate from his and he grips and pulls her back in. Guys, if you see this in a service station, wonder if somebody's being trafficked. Look, something is not natural about a man physically grabbing a woman and moving her body around. And that's not comforting. I'll just leave it at that and say, every time I see this guy, and all the family isn't family, he's trying to, he's trying to appear human and appear to be softer than he is, is what I see here. There are very few people that I see that I immediately think not a lot of value. This guy's one of them. This guy, I look at him and think, yeah, immediately lock this guy up. We'll figure out for sure what happened. But he did something when I saw this. And yeah, is that 
Is that a little bit of projection? Maybe. But there's enough stuff here to tell me that we'll figure out what he did. But this guy's done something. Scott, yeah. what do you got? Freud said if his lips are silent, he chatters with his fingertips and betrayal oozes out of him at every pore. And the same goes for deception. Now, what I'm going to say is not only does deception ooze out of every pore, he's like a remember the wacky water weasel. Did you ever have that when you're little? That thing it was it's just like looks like a cup. It's got these two goofy eyes on it, a little a little hair thing on it. You plug it into the hose and it like runs around, flies around, squirting water everywhere. And you try to run away from it, and not get wet, and dodge it, and all that. That's what we're seeing here. That's what his deception oozing out looks like. A wacky water weasel. Throughout these videos, we're going to see behavior by her that says that that will show. I'm concerned. I'm not concerned. I'm fe I'm afraid. I'm not afraid. Those types of things. For example, now we know this guy is an abuser already from the record he has. If you'll watch when he first says she's not good with cameras, she looks up and smiles at him. No, she's not good with cameras. So. And you're going to think, wow, she knows she's in on this as well. Here's why I don't think she's in on this. When you deal with a narcissist, when you deal with an abuser, that person being abused wants to connect with that person because they, when they first met that person, they were connected to him. When they were dating, they were connected. He was nice to her. He was love bombing her, in other words, firing off oxytocin, serotonin, and getting, and that helps her bond with him. Now, what they do is they cut off that oxytocin and that serotonin, those those good reactions and things, you know, those the, the positive reinforcement. And when they do that, that person is, is, in a way, addicted to that oxytocin and that feeling they have from that that abuser or that narcissist and or the psychopath whatever in whatever the case may be so they'll do anything to make to get some of that just to get a drop of it to look like a, a heroin addict would do anything to get to get a hit of the drugs man but to get anything they would they'll they'll, they'll try to get positive reinforcement from which gives them the oxytocin blast that's what we're seeing here. We see that over and over and over. She can hardly lock eyes with this guy. Every time he looks at her, she looks away. And if he, when he's looking at her, he's looking over her head, and she's looking at him. And then when he looks at her, she looks away. These are these are classic signs of someone being abused. Um, and the the hand that when she puts her hand to her face, uh, coming right out of the gate like that, that that denotes, from my experience, shame and guilt, which lets me know. And I'm just saying me personally that she's got guilty knowledge. She knows what's happened. We know she knows what's happened. But here's how we know she knew earlier. Because she's showing us, because she doesn't know how to act. You're right, Greg, these people are, they're idiots. I mean, just I don't care. I don't care what he says. They can't call me. Yeah, they're both idiots. Um, so they don't know how to act. He thinks he knows how to act. He thinks he knows how to act like a person who's feeling sorrow and sadness, but we don't see any, any, any expression of sadness. We don't see any heavy breathing. It's all actually light breathing. We don't see anything that lets us know he's stressed other than what, from, from the situation he's in, but no grief stress is what I'm, was what I'm trying to, to get to there. When she's covering her face, she's not, she's, she's covering her face like this. You see the fingers going like this. She's pushing on her tear ducts because there are no, there, she's not trying to push tears out. There are no tears in there. And so what she's doing, she's pushing on those because she's thinking tears, tears, and there are none from either one of them. No grief muscle, no nothing. So when you watch her push on her face and you see her with her hands to her face, watch where her index fingers go, right to the insides of her eyes on her tear ducts there. And if you're an interrogator, this is how you step in and go, hey, man, let's separate. We got to keep them separated. I don't think they've been talked to yet with this because look at the way they're acting they don't have a story together they haven't rehearsed it they've said okay here's what happened okay that's what happened which is what usually happens when people do something they'll say here okay here's what happened here come the cops you sit there real still in the car and the car cops come up and you all tell the same story because you've heard the driver telling the story and so when it comes to the, the guy in the passenger seat or girl he or she tells the story the guys in the back seat tell the same story but when you separate them you haven't got that story clean yet that's when you start Finding out what the real, who's really being honest and who really isn't at that point. All right, that's, I'm going to stop there. No, she's not good with cameras, so I apologize. But we were just like, for anybody that has any information, I don't remember a lot. What I did remember, I was breaking up, you know, with the cops, but I know that if, if, if anybody's got anything, any, any places that I could have gone, anybody, did you know who you are? 
Please, find him, please. It mean a lot. It mean everything to us. And this family ain't the same without family. That's for sure. Um, can you tell us what the last thing you guys remember the last time you all were together? Saturday? Yeah, Saturday was the last time we were together. Saturday, Saturday night. Saturday night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were all together sleeping and well the baby with me and her in the bed and Toulouse in the other room because we usually you know we usually are together as a family but you know. it's not easy I don't, and I don't remember much of all right uh, Mark what do you got yeah lovely uh, so first thing that uh, triggers a red flag for me is you can see how well her hair is tied back would you ever think that any of her hair would get in her face it's not going to because it's super tied back and we see some grooming there it's not necessary it wouldn't be necessary to do that there wouldn't be hair in her eyes so that's a sublimation of something else that's a, a distraction or a comfort gesture or something else. something is going on here yeah um uh, when, when were you last together? Saturday. Saturday, upward inflection, and she looks up to him. Uh, she's asking for approval on this. They're now looking, number one, maybe to get their story together. That's possible. Or somewhat the story has been got together and she's going, hey, am I, am I getting this one right? Do you approve of how I'm performing here? Could be an element of that there. Oh, very muddy timelines, by the way. Just muddy, muddy timelines that already don't make a great deal of sense. Puts herself in the victim state there. It's not easy. It's not easy. I don't, and I don't remember much. So we're back into the not remembering piece there, which is either a tactic or he sincerely has no idea what was going on there. That's a possibility as well. I just want to give you um, one little model or a series of models to think about how they're behaving and how they're performing right now. Uh, you can think about things in terms of, um, I think it's Joe Navarro's idea there of comfort or discomfort. That's a good way to just have a simple way of going, do they look comfortable or do they look uncomfortable right now? I often think about things like warm or cold. Do they look like they're warm and open or do they look like they're cold or closed? I've maybe told you about these before, but I wanna give you one more of these which is, are they being direct or indirect? And so direct movement is very, very clear. It seems to go where you think it should go immediately and it gets there relatively quick. And when it's there, it really feels like it's landed. Both of these two, especially the male, are super indirect at the moment. It is a Scots, you know, got his, 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 uh, his model there of the uh, wild water weasel, whatever it is. <laughs> Those things are interesting wacky. to watch. Wacky, wacky water weasel. Those are interesting to watch because they're unpredictable and you don't know where they're going to go. They're very indirect. Okay, so that's what I'm looking at here is going, so this body language is very indirect in a place where I would imagine you'd want to be very direct because time is of the the essence time is ticking away here for your child you'd want to be direct so again red flag goes up for me why are they being indirect when i think they should be being direct greg what do you got on this so one thing you will notice they have not yet mentioned this baby's name once, once. period not once not once does anybody know the baby's name? Well, he's called CJ. CJ because it's Caleb Jr. And try to remember that baby's name because nobody will. But they are so internally focused 
internally focused that they're trying to get their message out without paying any attention to what these other people are doing they're keenly unaware that people perceive them the way they do because that you can see they're actually a little amused that they got their story out that it was saturday and she looks up for approval agreed oh yeah it was saturday now she's looking to this guy for approval and requesting approval for him and if that's your strong point that left shoulders whipping because it's uncertainty when he's answering every one of those you can't miss that single shoulder shrug constantly now it could be a behavior trait that he has because he's done it so many times but likely in this case he's uncertain of what he's saying i'm not going to beat this one to death i'm just going to say there's a lot of them trying to collaborate and corroborate each other's story face to face and they are so internally focused they're not aware even that those officers are standing there going yep okay this is good this is shooting fish in a barrel or that even the people who are interviewing them are focused people in volatile relationships often don't notice people outside them i'll just leave it at that and chase what do you got yeah i absolutely agree with you guys and he's clean shaven looks well rested has a very recent haircut and she's repeating his words, sometimes verbatim, and looking up at him with uh, trepidation. I think, hypothetically, if there was a scenario where a narcissist husband did something to his baby, that would probably lead to a conversation of, we can't fix it now. It's already done. Uh, you can either ruin my life, your life, and the kid's life for the rest of our lives, or you can get on board. The only way that we're going to fix this, look at me, look at me. The only way that we're going to fix this is to get this story straight and we're going to go to the police. That's the only way I'm going to be here for the kids. Everything's ruined for you, for the kids, for everybody. If any of this goes to the police, all we're going to do is screw up our life. And that's hypothetically uh, what I think might happen in a, in a scenario like this, which is uh, pretty bad. Scott? Yeah, I'm glad you picked me next because you're right, man. You're exactly, that's exactly, I'll bet you, I didn't think about it that way. But when you say it, it's like, yeah, you're right. That's exactly, you know, look at me. So you don't go to prison too, because we're all going because we waited this long. But she can't help it because she's afraid of him. So no wonder she's not going to say anything. You know, when he says, when they say, when's the last time you were together, they both pause and think about it. Greg, if, 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 uh, you, if somebody, if you said that to somebody and they, and you were like, well, when's the last time you saw him? What are you going to do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. Gonna go, so, uh, 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 yeah, I'm yeah. not going to say a damn thing is what I'm going to do. If you're asking exactly. me if somebody else is in the room, I'm going to get deadly quiet. Exactly. I'm not exactly. going to, that's why I'm saying they're not smart enough to realize people are watching. No. No. And when little kid, and when you, if your little kid is missing, you're going to know exactly what time it was. She was 7.30 and here's where I was. I did this and all of a sudden he's gone. I think that guy took him. Somebody must have, there's nobody, somebody must have taken him. There's no out as to what they think has happened to him. Chase's point earlier on, there's no emergency here. There's a, this is, this is ridiculous. And that makes me think, it's, because it wasn't long after this where he was, where they, where he it, um, admitted to what he'd done. Right. So or they, I would they think, found the body at first year, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, don't I don't know, know how the how the thing unfolded, but yeah. All right, because I would think, I think that Captain Beasley would take him in, take him in a room and say, "You set your down right now." Now, what do you think's going on? And doing that whole thing, not being nice, not being, "Hey, let's talk about." It. I would say none of that. You go the damn jugular right there. So in this in this case, well, I'm going off on a tangent. Um, they know ex he says nothing when that when when they ask that. And notice it's a woman asking it. Saturday. The first few questions are all women. I'm sure they're dying to, to, to be talking to these people because they see it on them. And, and when he, he said, where were you all last together? He doesn't say anything. He says nothing because he knows when they're last together. And then she says, Saturday night, she's fidgeting around. She's so uncomfortable. She can't hardly stand it. And um, again, she's putting distance between them both. When he says, the baby, me and her in bed. We were on together sleeping and well the baby with me and her in the bed and Toulouse in the other room that's when she looks up and is like what that's not right uh, i think he i think he did that he was out and the baby was out in the same room he was and i think whatever he did he did that and then took the baby out that's what i think happened um 
and and while she's while this is going on, she starts texting. Who she's on TV? Who's she texting while she's on TV? She's using her phone to hide. She's hiding away from from. She's insulating herself, Greg. She's it's an insulator where she's she's getting in there and she's in the middle of something. So she's she's trying to blank, I guess, blank all this stuff out because she knows that this isn't going well at all. Not at all, because she's looked at that Captain Beasley a couple of times, too. And that cat's not having any part of it at all. Not even a little bit. All right. Who's next? Mark? I think we're I think done, done now. I, I didn't know. I didn't pick up on the on the on the shaving and the and the haircut. Uh, so I was interested in that because what I did notice was a crease down the side of the of yeah, the t-shirt. It's a, a freshly shirt. ironed t-shirt shirt. or straight out the bag. It was and folded. Like, it's, it was folded, it's, it's, Mark. Yeah. You can see the fold yeah. marks right yeah. down. Yeah, there. yeah, but it's but it's for, yeah. So it's like it's like it's like box fresh, That's and, his and shirt. that. Yeah, and that for me is like, ah, oh, guy, totally. you you managed to get a box fresh shirt out for this. That's kind of, I'd have just grabbed. I'd be in. <laughs> I'd be what you know. I don't know what I'd be in. I'd probably be I naked. Know I don't know for sure. If, I don't know for sure if this is a married couple or a baby mama kind of thing. I don't know because she talks about her two year old, not their two year old, her two year old. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. This is. There's some volatility here for sure, but I don't think he's clean shaven. I think he's got he's got a little beard on there. Chase it looks like yeah, two he, days, yeah. he, but he's shaved over here. Yeah, I think okay. he deliberately not shaved in the in the mouth area. Okay, All gotcha. Right. Saturday was the last time we were together. Saturday, Saturday night. Saturday night. Yeah. We were all together sleeping, and well, the baby with me and her in the bed, and Toulouse was in the other room, because we usually, you know, we usually are together as a family, but. Yeah. It's not easy. I don't, and I don't remember much of. When did you all realize that you were missing? Uh, I, they, they didn't. I was home with my oldest, my two-year-old, and he was with, CJ was with him, and I forgot uh, he went to go pay gas at a gas station and realized that he was gone. And he let the police know and me know that he was missing. Wow. Wow. Gosh. Okay, Greg, what do you got? I'm not going to have a whole lot for this. It's more of the same. It's there's some posturing and storytelling and she says, I, I was here and he was with, and he said, I didn't tell him there's some talking. I can't figure out exactly what he's talking about there. He kind of trails off. I think it's more of a signal of, hey, hey, careful what you say. He's got a hand on her again. Regardless of whether she was involved, she certainly knows what happened. And he's trying, I agree with you, Chase. This is a, you better listen to me or you're going to jail for the rest of your life. And she's listening. And she doesn't seem like she's altogether there either. I mean, the way she's responding, I'm going to leave this one at that as about as much as I can take of it. And uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, I think I think he gave her the cue. That was her that was her part to talk because he didn't want to say anything at that point because he knows all this stuff. She pretty much knows, too. But that was her cue, I think. I, th I think he was cueing her in to talk. And that's why he looks right at her and he's doing all that weird dancing around wacky water weasel stuff. Um, then... Um, yeah. When when then when when she says when did you all realize he was missing? They haven't thought that they haven't. Like I said before, they were in the car, whatever. Said okay, here's what happened. Blah blah blah. Here's our quick story, and didn't get the details. And so when they when that woman asks the reporter asks that question, where did you realize he was missing? She has to lie about it, obviously, because she's got to come up with the time. And we all know, because I've talked about it a thousand times, when you lie, the brain has to do three things. First thing, first thing it's got to do is stop you from telling the truth. Hang on just a second. Make something up and then deliver it. And in the delivery is where you see most of the action in this. You see a lot of it when they're thinking it up. But the big stuff comes on, the hardcore stuff comes on in, in delivery. 
And that's all we're seeing in there. That's a, they're actually putting themselves in the liar's loop. They're sticking to get ready to go down the, the, the uh, Greg and I have a thing in that, in uh, the true crime workshop where uh, how you tear a lie apart and you can box somebody in fairly quickly if you use this loop and they're putting themselves without going into details of all that, they're putting themselves in this loop uh, in, in the death spiral of a lie almost right out of the gate with this. It's, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't have much else to say about that either. Chase, what do you got? She's all all shame, very little sadness, and she's being abused at home. I would I would stake my career on that. But uh, this downward gaze that he's got with this bouncing movement is most likely an expenditure behavior. So he's just burning off excess energy. So he sees his biggest problem as I need to manage this stress, not display sadness. So he's seeing stress management as a bigger problem than displaying sadness. So that's taking over uh, his his physiology and and his CPU, his his brain uh, at that moment. And I think her fear of him is absolutely palpable uh, in in this clip right here. And this this gaze that he has downward is just planning, strategizing, and ensuring that she stays on story. And I think this is, you know, this is where we're starting to see that she heard that speech. She heard that speech of we can't fix this. We can't go back in time. We're all going to go to jail. You're going to screw my life over. You don't want to be responsible for that, do you? That kind of stuff is is hardcore. And I think she's trapped in several different ways in this video here. And uh I want you to see this uh, on the very final frame of the video. This glance that he has says a thousand words. This is disdain and careful observation of her is a horrible human being. So if you ever see something like this for your friends, ask him if they're okay when they're in private. Take a look at this up. And sometimes all it takes is someone just to notice that and then ask the question because a lot of people you'd be very surprised get into a, a relationship like that and feel like it's normal and they feel like it's normal until somebody starts to ask questions about it and they begin to understand this isn't this is not how everybody else lives that's all i got though uh greg i think it's mark <laughs> i'll be i'll be greg Here. uh yeah okay. good good points there uh good points there chase um, so it starts for me with, with an eye block, uh, right from moment one. And, and even that's odd. In fact, the whole idea right from the start of, of she's not good with cameras. If you've got kids, you know that they pull a whole resource out of you that you didn't even realize you had. You know, if you thought you were busy before, like when you got kids, it's like, wow, I can get, I can get a lot done. I'm getting done everything that I did and all of this at the same time, you know, this is what busy really is. That, so they pull a whole resource out of you. And so when your kids are in trouble, like it pulls another big resource out of you. You've got a lot of power to get stuff done. Do you think you're camera shy at that point? Do you think anybody's like, I, mm, I'm not sure I can really face the cameras right now? No, you, you, You'd be there, you'd be fronting it up. You would be getting eye contact with all those people out there. Your inhibition would be gone because there's only one thing on your mind, which is I'm gonna get my child back. I wanna save my child. So I don't get the eye block right from moment one. He deflects right at the start. He says, uh, you know, when did you know they'd gone? I, well, they didn't. When did you all realize that they were missing? Uh, I, they, they didn't. Well, that's a great deflection, isn't it? We're not going to talk about when we realize they're gone. We talk, we're going to talk about when they didn't realize at all. So it's a complete deflection to the negative over to somebody else. Uh, very interesting move. Lots of dominating um, moves there, including a control of, of, first of all, the neck and then controlling the head. So we've moved from domination of the shoulder to now getting control of the neck 
and and the head. And you'll know, you know, if you if you grab somebody around the neck, they've still got a lot of power from their shoulders. If you can take control of their head, they got a lot of trouble right now because that's the thing working most everything else. So wherever the head's going, you're going to be able to lead them. Same as the center of gravity. If you take control of the center of gravity around the stomach area or take control of the head, there's not a lot they can do. So highly dominant uh, behavior there. What I really, um, what I really enjoy about this is then his look to uh, Captain Beasley and then Captain Beasley's friend who's off, off camera there of like, can we can we end this now? And no, we're not going to end it. <laughs> not going to end it. We're just like, no, we're not going to help you out. You're going to oh, keep man. on going. We're going to see where this one goes. You're going to have to walk away from this. We're just going to let you keep on running and we're going to see where this goes to. I'm almost sure this is a definite tactic from them because I have seen police with, with other victims in this case and with a victim they are often very very careful to take them away to comfort them to make sure because because that victim may well have information they're an asset at, at this point and keeping them comfortable and safe is a great asset these two are not trying to keep them comfortable and safe right now quite quite rightly i think um yeah that's what i got Hey, I, I, let me add back one thing. One thing that I noticed in her, and Chase, I think you hit it dead on the head about him. What he is doing is all that nail biting energy is coming out. He's, he's not biting his nails, but look at his fingers are chewed down to the nub. It's coming out. You can't hide that. That's the reason it's easy to interrogate somebody who does that because they bleed. But in her case, she does something very interesting is that when you play with your brow, that's not associated with grief. That's associated with stress. And that drives the whole point, everything everybody is saying, that she's stressed because there's the number one threat right there next to her. And she's probably smart enough to realize that he might be a threat, but that's also a threat standing right there. And that threat or that danger is going to override her grief in this case, whether she has grief or not, not sure. But look at that playing with the muscle in her forehead. Every one of you has done it instinctively. Put your fingers to there. Because those two lines that are going up are not grief. Those are concern or other negative mm -hmm. kinds of things. But look at it and pay attention. It's, there's no arch. It's just she, she's playing with her forehead. And it's also eye blocking. Yeah. Also, I think that I think she is becoming his adapter. As he's squeezing on her and like you would like those little, you know, stress balls or something. He's doing that <laughs> stuff to her. She, she's how he's getting his, his uh, stress out is on her, which is I'm sure he does in life because he's an abuser. So that's one That's one, one that stood out to me when he's got his hand around her neck and those types of things. We'll see him get even tighter here in a few minutes. I think he's using her as, an, as his adapter, you know, or his adapters are, or he's releasing that energy on her. Just, yay. Yeah. Yep. When did you all realize that you were missing? Uh, I, they, they didn't. I was home with my oldest, my two-year-old, and he was with, CJ was with him, and uh, he went to go pay gas at a gas station and realized that he was gone. And he let the police know and me know that he was missing. we did know. If we knew, he would have already went there. How's the rest of the family holding up? I know this is a tough it's, ordeal, but... It's been taking a toll on everybody. Everybody's saying prayers. Everybody's keeping an eye out for him. So... Um, all right, Chase, what do you got? First thing on my notes here, I had to download these and watch them on a plane today. But the first thing here, he's using her to burn off his own anxious energy, like you were saying. There you go. 
And the, the squeezing on the shoulder starts during his uncomfortable silence. So it's a little like a, a stress ball. And he's more focused on getting it over with than, than getting a kid back. And when she's saying people were saying, we, you know, people are letting us know they're saying prayers. That's her saying other people believe us unconsciously. She hasn't planned this out. But I think that's her communicate. Other people are, you know, they're saying prayers because they believe us. There's a missing perpetrator. Uh, there's no request for help. And he's controlling her like a puppeteer in this uh he's focused on planning and strategy he's aimed at the ground even responds with this stupid moronic quip back at the reporter like well if we knew we would have we would have went there if we know he would have already went there what an idiot i'm sorry mark go ahead no fair play he retreats and gains height dominance yeah partly because of the of the step maybe but he does prefer hanging out with the height dominance there he does want to re retreat at this point uh just again uh captain beasley just fantastic do you, he says do you want me to say anything else and the guy is almost deadpan other than to what scott was saying earlier which is there's some anger there from him. Beasley, I think, knows where this one's going. But again, great stoic attitude there, pinning him in. That's what I got on that. Greg, what do you got? So I'm going to cover a few things. One is we talk about liar's loop, which says there is a trigger, then you fabricate, then you, you deconflict with your life, and then you pitch, and then you defend. Well, you can see her clearly standing in the headlights of the liar's loop if she hasn't thought of these answers and she's trying to respond and she starts to dance around and she does that cover her face thing again where she's playing with her brow the second one is he does a contracted denial no, I don't. and you guys always hear us say non-contracted denial it causes us to pay attention what we want you to hear is patterns patterns matter this we know this guy did this and he says no i i, I don't so that's his word pattern the piece that's interesting for me as well here is this whole control thing that's going on. How much he she start he starts to move away from her and then he grabs her and pulls her back over. If you've been around people who are in a drug-fueled relationship, I'm not saying she's druggy. He certainly looks it and I'm not sure she isn't. They they make me think of the movie Sid and Nancy, you know. Mm. It, that that kind of thing. Those volatile relationships get all kinds of nuanced things for relaxing and we can't see all that from the outside, but I certainly see anxiety in her. Is the anxiety caused by she's not sure what he's going to do? Is it caused by the liar's loop? Is it caused by something else? But there's a moment of romance, her looking you dead in the eyes and trying to convince you, and then there's a dance. If you take that video and play it very fast or very slow, you'll realize how weird all that body language is. He's looking for the door and then he moves, and then she's looking for a different door and distancing, then he grabs her and they pull back over. It's like two mimes in the park almost, if, you, if it were not such a horrible thing. You watch it that way, you'll be amused because it, it's an absolutely foolish looking dance. And that's the kind of thing that happens in relationships, especially volatile relationships, is that dance and that not being able to separate. Now, I don't know what he thinks he's accomplishing by doing that, by grabbing her and moving her. I think you're right. Chase is just his adapter and his way to release nervous energy. But it surely looks bad. And there's no way that I look at that and think, OK, they're both being honest. She's not anxious. She's not trying to get away. Again, if I saw that at a service station, I might think, hmm, what's going on? If you see that kind of behavior and the people are not together, then you know it. I've been in situations in my life where you happen on an abusive relationship. When I was a young guy and used to go to bars, guy in the parking lot slapping his woman around, as he's called her, and I went over to stop it. You know, It's that kind of behavior that I saw there. I saw, no, you're not moving and keeping control. Really weird. I'm, I'm gonna conjecture just like you guys do. This is, there's something going on home and she's listening. It's because that's how they work. That's all I got. Uh, Scott. Yeah. Uh, right out of the gate on that one, we see when she's rubbing her face and bouncing around. Those those are all adapters for her, trying to get rid of that. And like Greg, you pointed out to us that you usually don't, you know, touching your forehead that right in there isn't something where you show sadness. It's where you show you're dealing with stress. I agree. She's, I think what we're seeing in her, uh, a myriad of emotions coming from her. No sadness. 
because I think she's sort of in shock that this has happened. I don't know how long after the, the, that he went missing that this has happened, that CJ went missing. But she's feeling, she's got fear, she's got shock, she's got a frustration, a lot of frustration when she when she looks at him a couple of times. And then she has to be nice to him and, and smile at him. I think she's a, she's a wreck. And I wouldn't be surprised if she's the one that said, look, here's what happened. You know, after taking his him in the room and going, look, you know, tell me what happened. She's she probably opened right up after that. And they probably understood that, that she was the only reason she didn't say anything. Back to Chase's um, speech to her, what he, what the guy would say to her. She probably said that, you know, he said he'd kill me if, if I didn't do that. Now, I think she's really afraid. And I agree with you, Greg. This is this is exactly the behavior you, you see when somebody's being controlled, you know. And Mark talking about actors, I think the actor that could do this and hear me out because it's it has nothing to do with looks. Brad Pitt could do this. Hand to God, I think, because he can look that uncomfortable. I've seen him do it in a couple of movies. And man, this guy is so uncomfortable. You can't, you can't fake that. But I think that's the I think I think Brad Pitt could do it. I think he could act. Pitt is the is the act. king of the of the wild wacky wacky water weasel. He there are a number of <laughs> characters that basically Cast. he's doing he's doing uh, wacky water weasel acting. You know how we're all the time. It's, it's his method. Jo- it's his method. Exactly. You know how we're all the time quoting Joe Navarro. We say, "Well, Joe Navarro, think, there'll be some kid that comes on and goes, well, Scott Rouse's wacky water weasel theory.' So I'll be known as the wacky <laughs> water, water <laughs> weasel <laughs> theory guy." In all this. Careful what you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, careful, I'm gonna teach that at, quote, right? Teach that at yeah, acting yeah. schools. Do you guys have any idea who is someone talking about taking him or no. no, I don't. I wish we did know. If we knew he would have already went there. How's the rest of the family holding up? I know this is a tough ordeal, but... It's been taking a toll on everybody. Everybody's saying prayers. Everybody's keeping an eye out for them. So... What do you got? 